Okay, hope uh, people are able to see the screen. So in this session, uh, we're gonna see the presentation of these five papers in this specific order. And uh, I'm gonna just have a few introductory remarks on uh, why I excited that these papers were included, uh, so on. All these fall under this broad theme uh, of fine-grained complexity. And uh, so fine-grained com so complexity theory traditionally dealt with NP-completeness uh, of computational problems. And this notion of fine-grained complexity sort of gives this more refined uh, distinctions between exact runtime needed to solve problems. And uh, it was initially sort of uh, expressed for problems in P where you had, they had to rule out some quadratic algorithms and so on. Uh, but also it was used in NP completeness uh, for taking NP hard problems and distinguishing problems where there are non-trivial exponential time algorithms for, uh, versus problems where the brute force is essentially the best possible thing. And of course, it also had all these connections to de-randomization and uh, everything in traditional complexity theory. Uh, so we have, in this session, we sort of have an example of each one of these things. We have examples of problems in P. Uh, we also have uh, NP hard problems, and we have computational complexity uh, standard uh, uh, questions that we ask. Um, in particular, let's look at um, the first paper which you'll see today is for showing that there are no better uh, approximation uh, or even exact exponential time algorithms for lattice problems. Uh, this is a line of work that started, I think, about seven years ago, and now we have some additional hardness and hardness approximation results uh, for these bounded problem, this shortest vector problem and its variance. So we're gonna be seeing about that. And uh, also as the advent of fine-grained complexity happened, the emphasis sort of on computational algorithms, which are like be sub better subquadratic algorithms, subquadratic approximation algorithms started to have a more punch because now we had tools to prove hardness results. So here in this talk, we're gonna see how for a natural generalization of edit distance called tree edit distance, we have a truly subquadratic uh, three approximation or three plus epsilon approximation algorithm. And this is truly interesting, like, uh, because now we have an emphasis, we always have a question of whether there's a lower bound or is there an algorithm? So we're gonna see in this case, there is an approximation algorithm. And of course, uh, you can ask standard, like in computational complexity, we have these intimate links between proof systems and so on and so forth. And so there are natural questions in which have, uh, you know, which are conjectured not to have subquadratic time or subcubic time algorithms. So one can ask, are there MA protocols which are non-trivial for these things? And they have also been recently shown to have connections with hardness of approximation. And in this work, they're gonna give very non-trivial uh, MA protocols for very important problems in fine grained complexity. And then finally, we're gonna wrap this all up with a couple of papers uh, related to uh, quantum computation and fine-grained complexity, uh, where the main question is, uh, uh, do how much does quantum speed up the al algorithms? Like, you know, if there are certain problems, like closest pair, how much does qu how much quantum speed up can we gain? Can we prove upper bounds or giving algorithms, quantum algorithms? Can we prove conditional lower bounds by putting forth some conjectures? And in this, in these two papers, we look at these things. The first paper looks at uh, a quantum version of the three sum problem. And based on that conjecture, it's gonna prove many interesting conditional lower bounds, quantum lower bounds. The second paper looks at um, a string problems and is gonna give non-trivial quantum algorithms for that. So I'm very excited that we have all these uh, you know, thematically unified uh, fine-grained complexity uh, papers in this session. And now I leave it to the first paper to First paper by improved hardness of improved hardness of BDD and SVP under CAP SCPH. Do we have a representative for the first speaker? Fantastic. Deep tank. Uh, are you able to share your screen? Good question. Let me see. 
uh, does he need to be the host? Yeah, I think you need to be the host. Let me try to see if it's possible. Hi. I guess I could now share my screen. Okay, great. Can you see it? Yep. Cool. Uh, wait a minute. I will uh, give you a call around the nine minute mark if it's okay with you. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Should I start now? Yep, you can start. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, my name is E and Today I'm going to talk about this improved hardness of BDD and SAP under GAP SETH. This is a joint work with Huck Bennett and Chris Pikett. So BDD and SAP are known as lattice problems. So I will start with introducing this notion of lattices. A lattice is roughly speaking a regular grid of points in the space. And more formally, a lattice of rank N is a set of all integer linear combinations of a basis of size N. Here, for example, we could see a lattice that is generated by the basis B1 and B2. And all the black dots are the lattice points. And we could also see that different bases could actually generate the same lattice. And the study of lattice is motivated by the uh, so-called lattice-based cryptography. Nowadays, we are kind of approaching more and more practical quantum computations. And there's a problem that attacker with quantum computation can break traditional cryptography based, based on uh, number theory. And one solution here is that we could, people could use lattice-based cryptography because people believe uh, lattice problems are hard to solve even with quantum. And currently the state-of-the-art attacks on the, on the lattice-based crypto systems are based on solving the exact or low approximation factor version of lattice problems, such as the SVP problem that I will introduce in a minute. And then here comes another problem that whether the attacker can solve these problems in 2 to the n or 2 to the n over 10 or 2 to the root n time actually has a huge impact on the security of the crypto system. So our work tried to address this problem by showing uh, the fine-grained hardness results for lattice problems. One, um, one problem studied in our work is the SVP problem. And in SVP, uh, important geometric properties that is con uh, concerned is the lambda one of a lattice L. Here it, uh, um, it is defined as the shortest LP norm of non-zero vectors in the lattice. Um, taking our previous example, we could see that the red vector B2 minus B1 is the shortest non-zero lattice vector. So here its length is lambda one of the example lattice L. Then the gamma approximate SVP problem in LP norm is defined to be the problem where we are given the instance, uh, given the lattice as the instance, and the goal in the problem is to decide whether lambda one of L is at most one or at least gamma. Another problem that is uh, studied in our work is the BDD problem, stands for, which stands for bounded distance decoding. BDD problem in LP norm with relative distance alpha is defined to be the problem where we are given a lattice L and target T. And also we are given the promise that the target T is close to the lattice. That is the distance of target T and to the lattice. It is at most alpha times the lambda one of the lattice. And the goal in the problem is to find the clo closest lattice vector to the target T in the, in the lattice L. Here to remark smaller alpha parameter corresponds to a stronger promise because we could see that the target is closer to the lattice and thus it yields easier problem. Here we, all, we also have a, a figure for an example of the BDD problem. 
if we consider the red vector t as a target, then uh, here in the problem, the goal is to find the closest lattice vector to the red target. While if the target is outside all the green circles, uh, the, the BD problem does not care about that case. And um, a pretty standard approach to fine grained hardness is to assume the exponential time hypothesis, ETH in short. And the ETH and its stronger version as ETH assumes the exponential, ex exponential hardness of three set and K set problems respectively. In our work, we also consider the gap variance of, the, of ETH and SETH, where problems gap three set and gap K set are involved instead of three set and K set. Um, we also use the randomized and non-uniform variance of all these ETH variants. We are randomized on non-uniform time is, um, is assumed instead of deterministic time for solving respective problems. In our work, we exploit the power of all these different ETH variants, and we actually show stronger hardness results for BDD or OSVP under stronger variants. And in particular, to show fine grained hardness results, we reduce the set problem on n var variables to lattice problems in rank c times n for some constant c. This um, actually follows a line of research in the fine, fine grained hardness of lattice problems, which starts with uh, the study of closest vector problem, which unfortunately I have no time to introduce today. And the result extends to SVP, BDD, and also to another problem called shortest independent vector problem. Now I'm going to, um, I would like to introduce our results. Our first group of results is, are the ETH type hardness of BDD problem. The first result says that BDD cannot be solved in any sub-exponential time, sub -exponential time for any norm P and um, any approximation factor alpha that is it's at least 0.98 under non-uniform gap ETH. Our second result is similarly that BD, BDD cannot be solved in 2 to the little of n time for any P and any alpha that is at least some quantity alpha double dagger. And here we have a, have a plot, um, plot of all these quantities. We could see, so here the dashed, hmm, so is there a question? Okay, so here, the, sorry, is there a question? I don't think there was a question. Okay. Uh, here, the dashed blue line shows the previous result in BB20. And we could see that our result two always improves upon BB20, and our result one even improves upon, upon result two for small enough P, and importantly, including the uh, Euclidean norm. Our next result is about uh, SETH type hardness of BDD. It says that BDD cannot be solved in 2 to the n over c time for any p and p that is not even integer, and any c and any alpha that is at least the quantity alpha dagger. This, is, uh, this assumes non uniform gap SETH. Uh, here is the plot comparing our result three to the previous result in BP20. You could see that our result three improves the previous result when um, P is small enough and C is large enough. Our last result is an SETH type hardness of the SVP problem. It says that for, um, so SVP problem cannot be solved in 2 to the n over C time for any P that is large enough that is at least about 2.1 and not even integer. And for any C that is at least CP, here to remark CP approaches one when P goes to infinity. So this is basically saying that SVP cannot be solved in two to the n time for, uh, for the L infinity norm. Here we have a, have a summary of the, all the results about hardness as well as algorithms for the SVP problem. In the previous work, AS18, we have, the, uh, to, we have a similar hardness, but only for the exact version of SVP. Our, our work here um, improves this result to the appro approximate version of SVP. And we also have the MP hardness for SVP for any constant gamma. 
And for large constants, we have some concrete exponential time algorithm. For gamma being some large enough polynomial, we have some improved exponential time algorithm. And finally, when gamma is exponential, we have um, the problem is easy to solve. Uh, so here, due to the limit of time, I could only uh, introduce one, one nine year in the proof that is called locally dense gadget. Roughly speaking, it's a gadget where we have exponentially more closed and short lattice vectors. Here in the picture, we can see that around the target T dagger, we have four closed vectors. But we, if we consider the open ball around the origin, there's only uh, it only contains the origin. And we have a main theorem that generically turns locally dense gadgets into harness results for the lattice problems. Finally, we construct the gadget from uh, either from the integer lattice or from a Kissing number results by bladders. And we actually get all of, all of our results by instantiating the main theorem with these gadgets. Uh, I would just briefly mention the open question. The first one is uh, whether we could de-randomize the whole process. To remark, we have randomness in both constructing the gadgets and also in the process of the main theorem. And second one is whether we could construct better gadgets. Thanks a lot. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. Any questions? We have time for one minute quick questions. Maybe I can ask. So what is the uh, issue in doing gap amplification techniques for like using tensoring lattices to get, go from one plus epsilon to any constant factor? Yeah, I guess here, um, because we are considering the fine grain hardness, we need to re we need to have reduction, like with constant with linear uh, blow up blow up in the rank. So I guess those amplification techniques such as maybe tensoring would have some uh, super super linear blow up in the rank. See. Thank you. Can we have the next speaker, please? Because we have to keep this moving. Uh, feel free to contact the speaker uh, over email or if we have some time left in the session in the end. So are you this next speaker? Yes, okay. I believe so. All yours. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, should I start? Yeah, please start. I'll give you uh, on the chat okay. one minute mark before the last minute. Okay. Um, so do you see the slides? I do see the slides, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go with a short talk and then we can go to questions. Uh, so in this work, we give a sub-quadratic time algorithm that approximates three edit distance within a constant time. All right. Uh, so here is a you know uh, examples that example that shows why three edit distance matters in general. Um, so you may be familiar with the edit distance problem. There, you the goal is to uh, compare two DNAs. For example, you have two strings, and then you want to know how many changes you need to make to one of them to make it equal to the other. Okay, that's uh, generally the notion of edit distance. Sometimes you want to go further. For example, say you have two codes and you want to know how far the two codes are from one another. Obviously, you can represent your code as a string and do edit distance, but then you would lose some information. So I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, here we have a command which is nested under the main function. So there is a nestedness between them. When you represent everything as a string, you would lose that. If you want to incorporate that kind of information in your uh, computation, you would rather you re represent your code as a rooted tree. And then every node of the tree would become, every command would become a node of the tree. And then if there is a nestedness, it like one command becomes a chart of the other. Okay, that's uh, the whole idea. And if there's any questions, feel free to ask uh, while I'm giving it. Okay. Um, so let me define the problem formally. In edit distance, we have two strings, and we want to know how many can transform into other, to other one. Um, these basic operations are character addition, character removal, and character substitution. 
Uh, sometimes there is weight, um, but for simplicity, we usually assume that everything has a unit cost. Okay, so we can solve it with quadratic time. It's a simple DP. Uh, so I'll leave that to you as an exercise. And um, well, this is not easy to prove, but there's a very, very famous work that shows that this quadratic time algorithm is kind of the best we can do for edit distance. All right, now what about three edit distance? This time we would have two rooted trees. Every node has a label. And then we wanna transform the first rooted tree into the second rooted tree. The basic, basic operations are inspired by edit distance. So this time instead of character, we have node addition. We can add a node in the middle of a tree or remove an existing node or change the label of one of the nodes. And then we would ask the same question. How many of these operations is necessary to make a transformation? Okay, uh, it's harder than edit distance because of two special cases. So if the um, trees are a star or the trees are a path, in that case, the problem is exactly equivalent to edit distance. But in many cases, the structure is more complicated. So you would expect that uh, the problem is actually hard. Okay, um, uh, so why does it, like, what's the difference between these two problems? This is a very good example for that. Say you have two codes and you want to compare them. The first code is a, like both of the codes are uh, on a bunch of nested for loops. The first code always starts with a block of A and ends with a block of C, or it starts with a block of B and ends with a block of D. The same we have for the second code, except that we start with block of A and end with D or we start with B and end with C, and we alternate between these four loops. Now, what is the point? The point is that if you represent these two codes as two streams, you would think that the edit distance between them is a small. I'll leave that to you as, a, as an exercise. But if you rather represent them as two rooted trees, you can see that there is a big difference between them. So in order to make a transformation, you need to make a change in every level of the root entries. So actually the three edit distance is omega of n. Okay, so the, the values could be far. Um, what do we know for three edit distance? Um, there's been a lot of algorithms. The first one had runtime n to the six, then it was improved to n to the four. There is n, n cube law again, and then there's n cube. This is the, uh, you know, the latest result that gets truly subcubic time and it still solves the problem exactly. Uh, I have to note that this only works if there is no weights included. If there are some weights involved in the problem, then there are some conditional lower bounds that uh, better, than, better than cubic is uh, most likely impossible. Also, there are some approximate solutions. Um, in quadratic time, we can get as close, like we can get one plus epsilon approximation. And here, uh, epsilon is, uh, arbitrarily a small constant. And in also near linear time, we can get down to root and approximation. Okay. Now, what is the goal? The goal is to get constant approximation in subquadratic time. And the reason we started with this question um, is that this question was open for edit distance for quite a long time. You can see how progress is made for edit distance. So in truly subquadratic time, the trivial algorithm used to lose n to the epsilon approximation. And then over the time, this factor was improved. In recent years, we got to constant approximation. And that's the state of art result for edit distance. The reason we thought that could be possible for three edit distance is simple. Um, the whole idea of this algorithm that loses constant is using triangle inequality. And that also carries over to three edit distance. So it seems that the ideas can also work for that problem too. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about the ideas, but if you're interested in the actual algorithm, you can listen to the uh, long, longer version of the talk. Okay, so here is the theorem that gets constant factor for edit distance. There are three steps in the algorithm. The one step that I explained to you is step one because that is the uh, main contribution of this work. And then the other two steps, we just borrow from the previous work as they are. So we don't change them. 
in the first step, there is a reduction. At the, at the end of that reduction, I show you that there's a matrix we are looking for. And, uh, and in the next two steps, uh, we find that matrix. Okay, so I'll, I'll just tell you what we can do for what we do in step one. Um, our algorithm for three edit distance is the same thing, except that as I uh, told you, step one wouldn't work for three edit distance. So we have to come up with a new step one that also works for that. And that's our actual contribution. So our contribution is a modified step one that actually works for three edit distance as well. Step two and three, we just borrowed them from previous forecasting. Okay, so what is step one? Step one is a you know, kind of a simple reduction. For edit distance, there are two strings in the input. We want to know what's the edit distance between them. In step one, we break the strings into smaller windows. Every window is an interval of the strings. And then we prove that all it takes for us to approximate the answer is to know the edit distance between these windows. OK? Um, so here is an example. Let's say these are the two strings. We would make these windows. The length of every window is substantially smaller than the length of the original strings, and they could you know, potentially have overlaps. Okay. Why do we do that? Um, let's put the windows of the first string on the left and the windows of the second string on the right. We look for this matrix. We want to find the values of this matrix. What are the values? The values tell you the edit distance between pair of windows. So every row corresponds to one window of the first string. Every column corresponds to one window of the second string. And these values tell you what the edit distances are. OK, that we do in step two and three. But let me tell you what, what we can do if the matrix is given to us. OK, so suppose the matrix is available. Then we can run a simple DP. It's basically the same DP that solves edit distance in uh, uh, quadratic time, but instead of going character by character, we go window by window, and because of that, the overrun time is subquadratic. Uh, so I'm going to be quick because uh, there's one minute remaining. All right, so step two and three find the matrix for us. So for three edit distance, we're going to do the same thing. First, we turn the, the tree into a string. Um, we put opening and closing parentheses for every node, and uh, the children of every node, the parentheses corresponding to and to the children of every node is included in the parentheses of the uh, parents node. The window idea wouldn't work here because if you just go by uh, with windows, every window may only contain opening or closing parentheses. So we have to come up with a better structure, which we call super window. It has two pieces, the left and the right. The left one considers the open, uh, contains the opening and the right one con contains the closing. Okay, so it would be the same thing except that Instead of having just windows, you would have windows and super windows. Again, we look for this matrix, and the elements of this matrix would tell us the edit distance between windows and super windows. So that matrix we do in step two and three, it's similar to the way we solve edit distance. Once the matrix is given, we, we can again run a DP and solve the problem. Again, the only difference is that instead of having just windows, we have windows and super windows, so the DP gets a little bit more complicated. All right, um, um, so this is the theorem. It's pretty much the same thing, except that it uh, runs in, it, it, it works for three edits. Okay. Great, thank you so much, Ari. Uh, any quick questions? If you're the... I guess uh, we can move to the next speaker then. Thank you again. Um, who is the next speaker? Ah, I see. Uh, how do I how do I pronounce your name? Uh, so, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, could you please unshare the screen? Oh yes. That's it. Right, can you unshare the screen? Okay. Uh, I'm trying. It should be at the top. There should be something oh, green. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, so I will send you a message around when you have one minute left. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, can you see the slide? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, so uh, this is a joint work with uh, uh, Shine Akmal, Li Jie Chen, Malavi Raj, and Ryan Williams. Uh, I'm Ce Jing. So uh, let me start by uh, explaining the two keywords in the title of our paper, Merlin Arthur Protocols and fine grain Complexity. So um, suppose we have two parties, Merlin and Arthur, and Arthur wants to evaluate uh, some function, but uh, he only has very limited computational power. So he lets Merlin to help him compute the answer of this function. But uh, uh, he, want to, he wants to prevent Merlin from cheating. So he wants Merlin to prove to him that the answer is indeed correct. Uh, to do this, we have uh, this proof system where uh, the prover Merlin uh, sends uh, Arthur the answer together with a proof stream. And then uh, Arthur runs a verification uh, procedure, uh, which is randomized. Uh, the input here is the input string X, the answer uh, claimed by Merlin, and also the proof string. And uh, we want this protoc protocol to satisfy uh, two uh, uh, requirements. Uh, first, completeness. Uh, if the answer is correct, then there should be a proof string such that the verifier accepts with probability one. And if the proof, uh, sorry, if the answer is incorrect, then for any proof, uh, this verifier should reject with uh, uh, probability at least two thirds. And we call the Merlin author time of this protocol uh, is the proof length plus the uh, time complexity of this verification procedure, uh, which we run on the word RAM machine. So here we mean that we take into account the, the time for reading the uh, entire proof stream into the uh, verification time. Okay, and we remark that if we uh, here require that the rejection probability is one, then uh, this becomes a non-deterministic algorithm. Okay, now let's look at fine-grained complexity. So in fine-grained complexity, there are several central problems that are conjectured to be uh, difficult to solve, uh, such as uh, orthogonal vectors, three sum and the RPS shortest path. And uh, based on uh, these hardness assumptions, we can use fine grain reductions to show conditional hardness for many other problems. And recently, uh, there is some interest in studying the Merlin Arthur protocols for uh, central problems in fine grain complexity. So here is one uh, example, uh, the previous work by Williams, uh, which studied the orthogonal vectors problem. So this problem is conjectured to be hard. The best known algorithm uh, needs roughly quadratic time to solve it. Uh, but uh, uh, Williams in 2016 showed that uh, solving the OV problem, and uh, it, uh, they can even solve the counting version, which is harder. Uh, it can be done in uh, n times d, ma time, where d is the uh, dimension of the input vectors. So this running time is, uh, nearly linear in the uh, input size, so it is uh, near optimal. And uh, it gives nearly quadratic speed up compared to the best known quadratic algorithm. And this uh, refuted the uh, Merlin Arthur uh, strong ETH conjecture. So, uh, and um, uh, this result also led to many subsequent works, uh, such as Birkeland and Kaskis. Uh, MA protocols for other problems, and also some uh, works in fine grain cryptography and average case fine grain complexity. So, in, in this uh, work, our question is uh, are there fast merging after protocols for other problems in fine grain complexity? And here uh, uh, we show that the answer is yes. Uh, in this work, we showed near optimal merging author protocols for three sum and uh, APSP, which are uh, two other uh, central problems uh, in fine grain complexity besides OV. And we also have many additional results. So here uh, we, we can divide our main results into uh, four groups. So let me go through each of them. So our first uh, result uh, is about the K-sum algorithm. 
where we are given n integers and we want to decide if there exists k of them that sum to zero. Here, k is a fixed integer, at least three. And uh, the best known algorithm for three sum takes a uh, quadratic time. And uh, more generally for k sum, the uh, best known running time is n to the k over two ceiling. And in this work, uh, we show that uh, certifying that uh, a given list of n integers doesn't have a k sum solution uh, can be done in Merlin author time n to the k over three. So in particular, we can uh, certify no three sum in near linear Merlin author time, which is uh, near optimal. And we can compare our result with the uh, previous result by Carmosino et al, which uh, gave a non-deterministic algorithm for the no three sum problem in n to the 1.5 uh, time. So uh, our results show that if we use the power of randomness, we can improve this running time, running time from n to the 1.5 to uh, near linear in n. And our three sum protocol has many implications in fine grained complexity. For example, the uh, subset sum uh, problem, uh, the, the best known algorithm for this problem uh, runs in roughly two to the n over two time. And we show that no subset sum can be certified by an MA protocol in two to the n over three time. And this uh, improves the previous result by Nederlof. Uh, with a slightly uh, better than n over two MA time. And also uh, our uh, three sum protocol can be used to give a near linear time MA protocol for the mean plus convolution problem. So this problem uh, is also conjectured to uh, require n squared time. Um, and uh, we show that it can be done in near linear time by a Merlin author protocol. Our second set of results is about counting cliques. So, uh, so previously there uh, was some uh, results on counting k cliques in a n vertex graph, and there are some uh, MA protocols achieving nearly quadratic speed up. And in uh, this work, we consider a harder problem, uh, which is zero weight k clique counting. Uh, we are given a simple undirected graph with n vertices and m edges with integer edge weights. We want to count the number of k clicks in this graph with zero total weight. And our theorem is that uh, this problem can be solved in MA time n to the uh, k over two ceiling. And in particular, for counting zero weight four clicks, uh, we can solve it in n squared uh, Merlin author time, which is near optimal for, for dense graphs. And we also have some further improvement for odd k on sparse graphs. For example, counting zero-way triangle can be done in uh, near linear MA time uh, in terms of the number of edges. And uh, uh, using our uh, counting, sorry, using our zero-weight uh, triangle uh, protocol, we can give a near optimal uh, protocol for the RPS shortest path problem. Okay, uh, we can also compare it with the previous result by Carmosino et al, which gave a non-determinist algorithm for APSP in n to the 2.94 time. Okay, our uh, third set of results is about k onset. So suppose we are given a kcnf, and uh, the best known algorithm for kcnf set runs in 2 to the m minus a constant times n over k time for some constant c. And uh, here we show that uh, certifying that the KCNF is unsatisfiable can be done in two to the n over two minus uh, some constant times n over k time. And the previously uh, best known algorithm for k onset problem uh, runs in two to the n over two time. So we uh, achieved a slight improvement here. Okay, uh, let me skip this. So our fourth uh, result is about quantified Boolean formula. So it's a canon canonical p-space complete problem, uh, and the brute force algorithm takes two to the n time. Uh, the previous work by Williams gave a three-round AMA protocol uh, in two to the two n over three time, and it was asked as an open question whether we can get uh, MA protocol 
in uh, this uh, better than two to the n time? And we show that the answer is yes. Uh, we, we show the uh, MA protocol in two to the four n over five time for uh, certifying a true QBF. Okay, so uh, these are all our results. And uh, I list two open problems here. Uh, can we improve the no subset sum protocol from two to the n over three to two to the n over four? And can we certify true QBF in two to the n over two MA time? These are two interesting open questions. And thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any quick questions? We have about 30 seconds. Also, can the next speaker please? Thank you. Thank you so much again. The next speaker is Subhashri. I will uh, send you when it's one minute left on the chat. Yes. Uh, you can you see the all slides? Can see? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Cool. Okay. Oh, just a second. Something is. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Oh. Uh, Something is going wrong. It's I don't think it's, yeah. It's I don't open. see any slides. No. Oh, you don't see any slide. Okay. Uh, now, do you see something? Yes. Okay. How useful are quantum computers? Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. okay. For some reason, it's going automatically and it's going really fast. And I don't know what is Maybe going you on. can use the, yeah, just this version. Yeah, okay. Just go slide by slide. Yeah. Okay, fine. Hi, everyone. I'm Subhishri Patro, and today I'll be talking about fine grained complexity via quantum box. Okay, this is a joint work with uh, Harry Bowman, Bruno Loff, and Florian Spellman. Mm -hmm. So we would like to know how useful quantum computers are. And uh, because quantum computers are a more powerful model of computation. And, um, but the problem is quantum speed up is not guaranteed for all problems. Like for example, for problems like integer factorization and discrete log, we have uh, exponential quantum speed up. But for problem like uh, three sum or triangle finding, the speed up that we know is only polynomial. And for problems like edit distance, fresh distance, we don't even know of any quantum speed up. And for, for problems which are like unordered search, like searching over like, like a list of n inputs, we know that the quantum speed up is optimal. But for problems like traveling salesman, CNFSAT, the speed up is not known to be optimal. And for problems like recommendation algorithms, we thought we had an exponential speed up, but turned out that it is not. And uh, recently there was this unfortunate result which also said that if some problems have only quadratic speed up, then with the current error techniques, we are not going to be uh, gaining any advantage for practical size problem. So clearly, it's very important for us to now know which problems we should, you know, invest quantum computers for. So actually, Ryan suggests that you unselect the use timings on the top ah, narration okay. boxes, and uh, then you should be able to. So is. Yes, okay, cool. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, yeah. So now for example, there was this several computational geometry problems where quadratic quantum speed up was shown to be possible. This was a paper by Ambinus and Larka. And in our paper, we using some techniques or con like conditional on some con uh, conjectures, we show that these speed ups are the best that is possible for these computational geometry problems. And uh, uh, for people like who are interested in, you know, uh, building quantum algorithms, like, you know, implementing these quantum algorithms on com quantum computers, then it is clear that it is not going to be helpful in the near term future. So we use this family of uh, techniques called fine grained complexity. 
And I should also mention that the fine grained complexity results in the quantum setting is not new to this paper. Uh, it has been explored by other groups and for other problems like closest pair and edit distance problem. So what is fine grained reduction? So imagine we have this problem A, which people have studied and they know it's really hard. They're not able to improve on this algorithm for problem A. And now you have another problem B. Now you wanna comment on the hardness of problem B based on the information that you have about problem A. And we can do that if we could reduce this problem A to problem B, okay? But how would, is that gonna help us? So if there was a fast algorithm for problem B, then we can use that to solve problem A faster, which is not believed to be possible. And hence there is no fast algorithm for problem B. So a lower, a believed lower bound for problem A implies a lower bound for problem B here, okay? And for uh, this paper, we take three problem A to be this threesome problem. Okay? Now, let me just briefly tell you what threesome problem looks like. We have this n integers, it's very simple. All we want to know is whether there exists a triple of numbers that add up to zero. So for this example, this is easy to see that there are, there's a solution here. Now, obviously there's a trivial n cube algorithm, but we don't like that. And there's a slightly less trivial n square algorithm, but I'm, I'm gonna give you a glimpse of this n square log n time algorithm, uh, but believe me that uh, this n square algorithm exists. So we have this input, we make a copy and we make a third copy and that is sorted. The last one is sorted. Now uh, we can go over all these n squared pairs and check their sum and check if their sum exists with a negative sign in the third list, okay? That would take us log n time. And because there are n square of them, it would take about n square log n time, okay? Uh, so now the, uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna ignore all these log n factors. So uh, I'm gonna be dealing with only the exponents on, with the, on n. So it was uh, conjectured that threesome requires n square time on classical computer. And, uh, like this conjecture helped us get a little more understanding on a lot of these other problems like computational geometry, zero edge way triangles, sequence problems, dynamic problems. And it kind of gave an explanatory power as to why people are not able to come up with these better algorithms. And um, so let's like we focus on these reductions from threesome to this computational geometry and zero edge way triangle form. And the interesting thing that we noticed were these reductions in the classical setting go through something called sorted threesome. It's a, like a, it's, uh, it's a variant of uh, actually sorting, but you can assume that to be just sorted, sorting, three, uh, sorting the input and then giving it to ask for threesome. And then there were uh, non-trivial reductions that were given from sorted threesome to this computation geometry and sorted threesome to the zero edge weight. And uh, so uh, th this we will discuss is very trivial and the other one we won't discuss in this, but they were the non-trivial part, okay? Like the only reason I'm going to discuss this, like just believe me that this is going to be important for us in the quantum setting. So I have to discuss this. Now, if someone asks me how fast can I solve sorted threesome? Now imagine, um, so I, if I have this input to threesome, I can of course sort it in n log n time. And then suppose I had a subquadratic algorithm for sorted threesome, then of course I can get a subquadratic algorithm for threesome but which is not believed to be possible. So sorted threesome must also require n square time. But now things change in the quantum world. Now for this threesome problem, we have a n log n quantum algorithm, uh, which is like almost quadratically faster than the classical one. So what you can do is you have this one copy of this input, but you sort it, that takes n log n time. Then, over these n square tuple, you do a Grover search. Now, for people who are not familiar with Grover search, using Grover search, we can search for a particular element in quadratically, like in root n time, if their input length is n. So here we have like n square tuple, so we use Grover, so it will become root n and times log n because of this binary search here. So now it's viable to conjecture that on the quantum computer, threesome requires n time. Whereas on the classical one, we know it requires n square time, 
That is, we believe that it requires n squared time. But the problem is all these classical reductions that we saw existed in the uh, classical setting, now they need not go through anymore. And we will look at one example to see how it fails, okay? Now let's look at the same reduction from threesum to sorted threesum. Now here, we don't have a fast, like we don't have a sublinear time algorithm to sort the input. So we are going to use the normal sorting, suppose. Then what we get is like that threesum requires still n time. So we don't get any intuition as to how hard sorted threesum is. So the reduction that was actually trivial in the classical setting <laughs> becomes really hard to quantize. But surprisingly, what we saw, the reduction after that is easily quantizable because there's some local property that we could use and we could make it quantum really easily. But we had to deal with this one. So this becomes the interesting part for us because we gave a non-trivial way to comment on the hardness of sorted threesome by using a quantum walk-based reduction, which is explained in detail in the paper and also in the, in the long talk. And uh, we also noticed that using this walk-based reduction, we were not just able to comment on sorted threesome, but a variety of sorted version, like in which are, like some sort of orderings on this input that would have taken n time classically, we could we would comment we could comment on hardness of that problems as well. And uh, consequently, we were able to uh, ensure that these reductions held in the quantum setting as well. And uh, as a consequence, we were able to prove some tight linear lower bound for most of these computational geometry problems. And we were able to show that the zero edge weight triangle finding problem uh, has an n.1.5 algorithm, and which is tight. And uh, so uh, we believe yes. that, sorry. Especially have a question on the chat. Also, can you wrap it up in less than a minute? Yes, yes. Uh, should I answer the question first? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, L let me then finish. I have another two slides. So uh, we believe fine grain reductions are the promising way forward for to prove anything beyond query bounds that we get, uh, especially for superlinear lower bounds. And uh, we also believe the proof strategy that we gave to prove the hardness of sorted threesome can be helpful for us to prove other results uh, based on like, you know, other orderings of threesome and other reductions from there onwards. And, uh, but one thing to notice here is not all of these geometry problems are closed. There are some of these geometry problems whose algorithms like we, we think uh, are the best, but we don't, there's still a gap and we don't know how to prove it yet. And future directions are, uh, there are other, uh, three some hard problems in the classical setting that are yet to be explored in the quantum world. And uh, like I said, there are some open of open problems here that has to be addressed. And finally, there are other problems like three some like CNF SAT or APSP, which can become central to the you know hardness uh, conjecture. And uh, lower bounds can be proved based on those hardness. Thank you for the attention. Uh, thank this is the thank end you of my so talk. much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the question on the chat is, what is the cost of the quantum reduction between threesome and sorted threesome now? Oh, so so this uh, this reduction goes through this uh, walk based thing. So um, okay, so what we do is we use this walk algorithm, and the walk algorithm actually like makes much smaller instances of these threesome problem and searches for a marked element there. So if I have to think, for, like it's not easy for me to right now think how costly the quantum reduction would be because it's it's like a uh, it's like breaking the problem into smaller problems and then uh, checking. So let me just 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 give me a second. So there'll be there'll be a setup cost. So that will be about n power two by three. No, n power three by four and an update cost. Yeah, I think it will be about n by n part three by four, if I'm not wrong, but uh, I'm, okay. I'm not confident here. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Can we have the next speaker, please? Thanks again for speaking. Sure. Yeah. yeah, actually, the meter
if I have another question. So what's the lower bound, the upper bound and lower bound for bounded variant of three sum? Do we know that? Like if there's an upper bound on the values of the uh, elements? Like oh, if the so upper bound is T, we can solve it in time like T log T in, uh, for classic yeah. one. What so can I haven't said that in the quantum setting because the, the techniques that we use for classical thing when there's a bounded uh, range is Fourier transform, right? Fast Fourier transform. But mm -hmm. in the quantum setting, though there's a fast Fourier transform algorithm, but it is not really the same. It doesn't output all these elements. It just puts it on the amplitude. So I don't know if we can use that very trivially uh, to think about this. Okay, can you also uh, uh, unshare your screen? Ah, oh, yes, sorry, yeah. Thanks. Yes, yeah. Great, sorry. Uh, so I'll again give you one minute thing, although we are running quite late. Yeah, should I start now? Yeah, please, thank you. Uh, okay, I'll be very quick because a lot of what I'm gonna say was also covered in the previous talk. So again, in this work, you wanted to also you know, make a connection between quantum algorithms and fine grain problems. Uh, so these are the problems that I care about. Um, these are simple problems, like uh, we teach them algorithm design edit distance, knapsack, subset some uh, very easy problems. And we know quite a lot about them in the classic setting. In quantum, we don't know too much, especially there is one question which is very interesting and that was the motivation for our work. As this was also discussed in the previous slide, edit distance and LCS or longest common subsequence, these are kind of like very famous and important problems in a fine grain. Our classic understanding is kind of tight. We know that we can solve them in quadratic time and there is a kind of a matching lower bound. But when it comes to quantum, we don't know too much, especially because the lower bound that we prove for edit distance goes through this problem, which is called orthogonal vector. And O we can be solved in linear time. So through this problem, there is no way to prove a quadratic uh, bound, quadratic lower bound. But yet we don't have any better algorithm. The best quantum algorithms you are aware of um, are, are, are exactly the same, like the best classic algorithms. So we don't know any improvement. And it's open whether we can improve the lower bound or upper bound or both. So that was the you know, question we started with. We didn't answer this question, but we, um, you know, we, we solved this question for other similar problems. All right. Um, so again, this was something that was discussed in the previous slide. In a fine grain, we try to reduce problems together. So we usually think of a problem as black box, and then we, uh, we, like, we, we think of that algorithm as black box and try to use it to solve other problems. In quantum, uh, we go very low level. Sometimes we draw circuits and using quantum uh, physics, we improve the optics. Okay, so um, for example, in fine grain, these are some conjectures. APSP is about the runtime of you know, uh, finding distances in a graph. SET is about uh, the runtime of solving SAT. And max plus convolution is about the runtime of uh, finding the convolution of two sequences. These are the conjectures. Based on these conjectures, we drive the problems. For example, if edit distance can be solved faster, with that, we can come up with a faster algorithm for SAT. And that would be inconsistent with SET. So that gives us kind of a lower bound for edit distance. All right, in quantum, we can actually improve the runtimes. And that makes the picture very interesting. For example, Grover's uh, gives us a faster algorithm for unordered size. Let's say we have a sequence of size and we are looking for one element in that sequence. Classically, we have to go over all of the elements. So it takes linear time, but Grover's can do that for us in uh, time root time. The other problem is element distinctness. This time you're given two sequences of size n. You wanna know if there is one element which is shared between them. Again, for obvious reasons, you need omega of time in the omega of n time in the classic setting, but in quantum, you can improve that to n to n. And the same holds for pattern matching. This time you have a text and a pattern. Um, you wanna know if the pattern appears in the text. Obviously you need to read the text and the pattern, so it takes uh, linear time to solve it basically, but quantum improves that to root n. 
And you may notice that all of linear quantum, even though the inputs are linear, that's because we assume there is an oracle that gives us the elements of it. Okay. Uh, so what do we want to do? We want to bridge the gap. So we want to do the same, uh, we want to use the same techniques that we use in fine grain. But instead of starting from the existing classic algorithms, we would like to start from the existing quantum algorithms. And that gives us better quantum algorithms for the rest of the problems. Okay. Uh, these are the two problems that we consider. Um, uh, one of them is called longest palindrome substring. The other one is called longest common substring. So in LPS, uh, you have a sequence of size n. You want to find an interval which reads the same both forward and backward. We call that palindrome. Oh, and among such intervals, you want to find the one which is largest. The second problem is longest common substring. Uh, we refer to it at, as, as LCS, but there is also another LCS problem, which is called longest common subsequence. In subsequence, elements have to be like, don't have to be close to each other. There could be gaps between them, but in substring, all the elements of the solution have to be next to each other. Uh, so in longest common substring, we have two sequences of size n. We want to find a substring which is the same in both of them. All right. Um, so why these two problems? It's because they are kind of equivalent in the classic setting. Um, we can solve both of them in linear time. It's basically with the same algorithm. Uh, so all we need to do is to read the strings. We make a suffix tree out of the strings. And then if you find one node of the suffix strip gives us a solution for LCS, if you find another node, it gives us a solution for LPS. So roughly they're the same. We just need to change one line of the code to switch between the two problems. Uh, our, our, uh, the message of our work is that even though the problems are equivalent in the classic setting, they're not equivalent in quantum. Um, what's not surprising is that we can bo solve both of them in sublinear time. Um, so our solution for LPS takes time root n, and our solution for LCS takes time n to the five six. What is surprising about this work is that there is a gap between the runtimes. We show lower bound for LPS, which is root n, which is tight, but the lower bound for LCS is n to the two third. And I want to emphasize that the lower bound is unconditional, meaning that no matter what you definitely need time n to the two set to solve LCS, which is kind of surprising because LPS can be solved in time root n. So even though they're equivalent in the classic setting, in the quantum setting, they're different. Okay, um, so I'm not planning on explaining the algorithm to you. I just um, want to wrap up by telling you that uh, after we publish our work, uh, there's another work that improves our result. Uh, their runtime for LCS is tight. So they, they also get n to the two set. So, and their runtime is tied up to party dark matters. And I guess there are a lot of other problems that are, uh, you know, that have the same situation, the classic setting, like APSP, center, uh, diameter. These are kind of problems that are equivalent. But I suspect that when it comes to quantum, we can show some gap. So these are kind of uh, interesting problems to study for future. Okay, so if there's any questions, I can answer. Thank you very much. Any quick questions before we wrap up the session? Uh, Said, let me ask a quick question then. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what is the intuition that there is this gap between the two problems? Um, for, for the like for the quantum world? Yeah, in the quantum world, how come? Uh, is there any quick intuition that you Yeah, so, so for example, uh, negative, like finding a negative triangle that can be done easily with uh, Grover's algorithm. But you're looking for three edges that you know, the summation of these numbers is less than zero. Classically, we have to go over all of the edges, but Grover's algorithm can do that much faster for us. So there seems to be a faster algorithm for that problem. But for example, Arpes showed us that, and um, that's very difficult to uh, improve the runtime for it. Even though these two problems are uh, equivalent in the classic setting, it seems that in the quantum setting, there's a gap between them. 
I see. That makes sense. I see. It's also the witness size probably is smaller in one. Any other questions? It's not, and we're also over time. So thank you to all the speakers and everyone who attended.